I met my abuser when I was 18. The first time that he physically assaulted me, it was three in the morning and he was just rambling on about the fact that he wanted me to make a mistake. And he started screaming his head off and just slamming things everywhere. And my son woke up. The problem with him was that any attention that I paid to my son was attention that I was not paying to him. And that was a major problem. He just closed his fist and punched me right in my head. The next day, I said, you know, I'm not gonna be with a person who's gonna treat me that way. And he completely dismissed the entire thing. He said that I was making it up, that he doesn't remember any of that stuff happening. So I kind of felt like, you know, maybe he was right. Maybe it kind of was my fault. Very often when women are living in domestic violence, they are told by uh, the person who is abusing them that it is in fact uh, their fault for the abuse and that they deserve to be treated that way. In Rhode Island, for example, last year, there were nearly 10,000 victims of domestic violence that received help and services from one of our member agencies. Last year, our department responded to 375 domestic violence calls. I think the goal of our shelter stay is to make sure that the person that's coming into the shelter is safe, number one. Number two is to make sure that their basic needs are met. When I kept insisting that I wasn't gonna stay there, he just broke down crying and he was begging me to stay and he didn't want me to leave and he was so, he was so apologetic that I really believed him. And you know, next day we started everything fresh. You know, he went back to doing the cooking and the cleaning and the rubbing my feet and it was just perfect all over again. So I kind of dismissed it as an isolated incident. After living together for several months, I actually became pregnant and I thought to myself, you know, who would hit a pregnant woman, right? Everything just went along a lot better, except that the entire cycle of him just being really nice to me, and then kind of like the tension, it just was a lot shorter after that. And it just like the physical attacks just came on. They were a lot more intense and um, with a lot more force. And he kind of just stopped feeling sorry for what he did. I mean, what we do is fundamentally um, empowering a victim to get their lives, to, to deal with the stress of the situation of domestic violence and the danger that that brings, but then to go forward and, and to get their lives back on track. And the shelter can be a very vital part of that. Honestly, I really, really hated the person that was staring back at me in the mirror. So a woman called and she was in the emergency room and I was new and I had just you know, gone through my training and I did a big huge faux pas as I went to the hospital where she was because she ended up in the hospital. She had been beaten so badly by her husband who was a um, physician. And, um, but she didn't have a way of getting home and she had no money and she was mad. You know, She was all st stitches and bruised, big huge bruise on her face. I mean, she'd really been beaten off pretty badly. And when I got there, her two little children were sitting on the bench with their hands crossed and their legs crossed, waiting for their mom to get stitched up. And it was awful. It was awful to see that, to see that somebody could be beaten up so badly by her husband, who's supposed to love her, and who was actually a medical professional. So I, I think it's, it really kept me going to know that there's a lot of women like that that are out there that need, need help and need resources. He physically attacked both me and my son, who was 10 months old at the time. I was able a couple of times to actually run outside. At one point, I was holding on to the railing uh, in the porch with one hand. I was holding my baby in the other hand. And he was trying to get me back inside, but because I wouldn't let go, he actually bent down and he bit me on my back. But I, I didn't let go. There was no way I was going to go back inside that house. And eventually, a police car did come. So he was arrested. and. Um, Charges were, domestic violence charges were filed against him. After almost two years going through the court process, he was finally sentenced to what, 10 years, four to serve, uh, six probation. Part of it is, is helping people get out of that cycle of domestic violence. That's very obviously critical to us and critical to the community. Once a person's accepted into a shelter, um, we develop what's called a safety plan. We try to make a route for her to get there or a safe 
uh, way for her to get to the shelter without her perpetrator or her abuser finding her. And that's usually developed between myself and the client to make sure they get there safely. We assure them that everything that they tell us is confidential and that we keep it that way to make them feel safe. Once they're there, uh, we do what's called an intake and we assess their immediate needs and see that those needs are met. Letting them know that domestic abuse is not just physical, it is emotional as well. And many times people don't understand that. It's controlling behavior. It's putting a person down and not giving them letting them know that they are valued and loved. He had broken me down mentally and psychologically so terribly that I felt like everything that happened to me and everything that he was doing, I completely deserved it. He had isolated me so much from my family and friends that I felt like I, couldn't, I didn't have anybody to turn to. If I went up to them with, uh, with what was happening to me and I tried to explain that they'd be angry at me because I basically shut them out of my life, so, you know, why would they want to help me now? I think making that first phone call is the most difficult thing in the world. But I can tell you and I can reassure you that it is absolutely easier to make the phone call than to go through what that person has been going through, and whether it's been for months or years or decades in that abusive relationship. These women are extremely courageous. They just don't know that they are. If children are on the scene, and they witness any type of domestic situation, and it's very hard because sometimes children have to be moved. Educating young men is, is gonna be a huge um, part of preventing domestic violence, and that's why I think it's just great that um, the Women's Resource Center is in the schools and working with young couples. After I found out that I lost uh, the baby that I was carrying because of how violent his physical assaults were that last night that I was there with him, um, the next day after I had a DNC, I actually, instead of resting like I was supposed to, I went to the courthouse and I decided that I was going to get a restraining order against him because I wanted him to know that it was me, not just the police, that wanted him to stay away. And that's when I met my court advocate who, she was incredible, she was. Um, she was completely amazing. She actually miss lunch and she sat out there with me while I just cried the entire time and I told her what had happened. Even after we successfully got the restraining order, um, she was still there for me. She would call me every time before we had to go to court uh, and after just to make sure that I was okay and so that I know that what I'm doing is the right thing and that I don't have to be afraid because he no longer has control over my life. Right now there's an issue in Congress where they're trying to repeal part of the Domestic Violence Act and take away money from the, from the project and so I think that maybe it's an awareness issue. You know, ultimately um, we'd love to be out of business because that would mean there's no domestic violence. That would be fine with us. But until that day comes, uh, we're going to continue to evolve the services that we have uh, to meet the needs of our clients. The word survivor to me means someone who has gone through a situation where they felt helpless, where they felt that they didn't have any control over their life, and they've learned to take that entire situation and turn it around. I, I have uh, the utmost admiration for the professionals in the Women's Resource Center, and they have uh, a tremendous amount of respect for them. So we are vital to help people actually move from a very scary situation, hopefully into a secure and safe situation. We are needed and the community needs us because if we weren't doing it, I don't know who else would. The Women's Resource Center is a very necessary part of this community. Does an excellent job in support uh, services for the victims and it's needed. I don't know what we do without it. Thank you.